Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. We are so excited to have you all here. I do not believe that uh, uh, rain is in any song that our artist is playing today, but we might end with the hymn, Michael, Row Your Boat Ashore. <laughs> Thanks for braving the weather. Um, I, I will announce uh, our artists shortly, just a couple of little things. Uh, first of all, uh, the concert today is being presented by Allen Organ Company of Mukunji and Trinity Lutheran Church, which is where you are at today. And uh, the instrument that you are going to be hearing today is a new Apex model, model GX350 draw knob. Okay, that might be important for some of you. Ask me afterwards if you want to know why. Uh, a little uh, invitation afterwards, we have refreshments downstairs, light refreshments directly out that door down the steps. And Debbie has asked me to have you form two lines when you go to eat. It'll go that much faster. All right, two lines when you go down to eat. All right. Uh, lastly, the best seats in the house, from my personal experience, are somewhere in the middle of the room, maybe about two-thirds of the way back. Uh, just fair warning, Rudy is going to be using the festival trumpet today, which comes from the back in the ceiling there. So if you like trumpets and you're sitting in the back pews, that's where you want to be. Otherwise, you might want to move a little bit forward. My name is Bruce Rohrbach. I am the director of music here at Trinity. The artist today is Mr. Rudy Lucenti. You see a bit of a hint of his background. Rudy is just an amazing organist, an amazing musician, and an amazing person. I have known Rudy for many, many years, uh, but he goes back a lot farther than I do in the music industry. You see him seated. Is that the uh, Wanamaker organ? That's the Wanamaker organ that's up there now. He uh, has been assistant organist at the Wanamaker, Oregon, down in Philadelphia at Macy's for 45 years. And you can see from that instrument, that is a, a seven manual, seven keyboard instrument with six. So I, 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 they're adding one, did you know? <laughs> six keyboards, <laughs> I have trouble counting. And uh, 13 expression pedals, so it, it's huge. If you see an extra set of arms fly out and another pair of feet, it's okay. Uh, just ignore it. The men in black have a little flashy thing afterwards, and you'll forget all about it. It's been approved. Rudy is going to be announcing his program as he goes, so there's no paper to follow. And he'll tell you a little bit about himself, I'm sure, the instruments, the songs, and so on. And if you're really enthusiastic at the end of the concert. There might be an encore, but that's gonna be up to you. So let's have a warm Wanamaker Macy's department welcome, department store welcome for Mr. Rudy Lucetti.
Good afternoon. What are you all doing here? It's a miserable day. I mean, this is when you sit home and, well, the Eagles aren't playing, so there's no point, I guess. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I opened with uh, something for the organ to introduce itself and say hi. Um, which is uh, the Royal Fireworks Overture of George Frederick Handel. Can't ever go wrong with, with uh, George. Uh, always a good composer to start with. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, this kind of came up rather suddenly that Bruce and I were talking about it, and this was a Sunday afternoon that I had available, and um, this is the sort of thing I really enjoy doing, just meeting with a group of folks, and uh, I know Bruce was talking about various places to sit, uh, in terms of, of how you hear this instrument, but as you'll notice, it kind of gets out nearly everywhere. The real problem with how you're sitting is that you are not separated into the two groups that normally come to organ concerts. And that would be half of you who really want to be here, and the other half of you who were dragged to kicking and screaming by the first half. Because that's generally what, what organ concerts tend to be. It's nice to see some, some folks that I know, some folks from near and some folks from far, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, uh, that's always kind of, a, kind of a fun thing for me, too. Um, when I first started at, at the Wanamaker Organ as an assistant, uh, it was February 3rd, 1978. I always remember that date because I had the five o'clock concert that day, but my daughter was born at 11 o'clock that morning. So, <clears throat> so I, I, uh, everybody was fine. And my wife said, you've waited years for this appointment, you gotta go. So I did. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, and I, I studied organ as well with Keith Chapman, who was the then head organist uh, at the time. And uh, like pretty much any of the major concert organists like Keith, uh, he was also an accomplished church musician. As a matter of fact, he was at, at Philadelphia's famed First Presbyterian and also at the Synagogue Knesset Israel in Jenkintown. So he held several positions at the time as well as Wanamaker's. So a lot of the music that he wrote uh, were a lot of original compositions, but he did a lot of arrangements as well. And he liked to take simple hymn tunes and arrange interesting organ pieces around them. And uh, for those of you who have played any of Keith's music, it's kind of interesting because it looks easier than it is to play. Uh, the piece that I'm going to play called Gaelic Air actually has two places in it where I'll actually be playing all three keyboards with two hands uh, with a pedal line going on as well. So uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting to do that. Uh, but in any case, so this is Keith Chapman's Gaelic Air. You'll know the hymn tune immediately just from the first four notes.
some point to put in what I call kind of a, uh, uh, a palate cleanser in a way. Um, something that is kind of just sort of, um, and I, I, it's sort of like, you know, it's like an ordinary organ sound, as it were. Uh, but in this case, uh, I've gone to a composer that um, isn't often performed, John Ireland. And he wrote a lot of choral music, uh, not a whole lot of organ music. Uh, but a, um, a concert artist some years ago uh, that, that I had come across, I went to a concert that he played up in Hackensack, New Jersey, like that. I think that's outside the continental United States, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, in any case, I, I did go up there uh, to that concert, and uh, um, so uh, he played this, this suite by John Ireland, and the only thing I thought about it was it was awfully long. Uh, but there was one of the movements of it that really kind of got my attention because it was very, in, in, in the best sense of the word, ordinary. I, I liked the ordinariness of it because it had a, a, a lovely lilt to it a little bit. It's a, it's a minuet, actually. It's actually called Menuetto Impromptu. And, um, but then it also allowed, it has this center section that allows the organ to uh, to change its character a little bit and go from kind of, shall we say, an ordinary sound to, you'll hear some of the string sounds on the organ and they'll kind of bounce a little bit back and forth between the sides of the room. Uh, you have the best seats in the house. I do not uh, like that. I hear what's right in front of me right here and, um, and I just sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm constantly saying little prayers of I hope what's coming out on the other side is working. So, um, I, I don't mean working as in working, I mean as in, working musically. So this is John Ireland's Manuetto Impromptu.
the, uh, uh, the running joke in Philadelphia at uh, Wanamaker, Oregon, is that I've played every trumpet or tuba tune known to man on that organ. That is not actually true. I do tend to play a lot of tunes like that there um, because of, of the particular resources to do that on an instrument that large. Um, but I selected one of those. I was originally going to play the David Johnson trumpet tune, but I decided against that because I keep getting in trouble every time I play it. Uh, I had a phone call at 10 o'clock at night from uh, an organist who had gotten sick and could I play for a service the next morning. It happened to be free. Church I'd never played in, organ I had never seen, congregation I didn't know. So I end up going there, it's only about 20 minutes from my house. And uh, so I played the service and it was, it was lovely and I thought, well, I need something nice at the end and it's a nice little organ and a nice little church. So I played the Johnson trumpet tune. And these two ladies came up to me afterward, and the one lady says to me that she's a member of the church, and um, she uh, was delighted at my hymn playing, she thought it was wonderful, and she introduced me to the other lady who had just moved, like was to her next door neighbor, and had just moved into the neighborhood, had just joined the church, and this was her first Sunday there. And this other woman said to me, I was fascinated by what you did with the Johnson trumpet tune. You made some little changes in it and added some, some ornamentation. And I thought, oh. you know, I didn't play it according to the score. She's probably some music professor from somewhere. She's gonna hammer me to death over this. So I thought, well, let me be nice about it. I said, oh, I said, are you an organist? She's like, no. I said, well, um, I said, if you don't mind my asking, how do you know the Johnson trumpet tune? She said, David Johnson was my father. Now, what were the chances of David Johnson's daughter moving into Jenkintown, going to a church for the first time, having just joined it, I get a call at 10 o'clock the night before and play that piece. So I would have played it, but then I would have had to know, absolutely certain, including Ancestry.com, that not one of you is related to David Johnson. So, but in any case, that said, I'm not going to play the Johnson trumpet tune. <laughs> I'm going to play the C.S. Lang's tuba tune, which is uh, a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit, actually a little bit more difficult to play, but uh, nonetheless, it, it works so well uh, on, in this room. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis something that Bruce said, I am not using the, the monster trumpet in the back for this particular piece. So for those of you who like kind of, uh, I wouldn't say subtle trumpet so much as uh, um, kind of polite like that. Then this would be your piece.
Some years ago, I became acquainted with a wonderful um, American composer by the name of Daniel Gothrop. Um, Dan and his wife Jane uh, became friends of my wife and I. They stayed at our home a couple times, and he's written some phenomenal music, and any of the church musicians here know exactly what, what I'm talking about. He's, he also is the composer in residence for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, um, and uh, he's recently moved actually closer this way. He had gone from Tennessee to Idaho, as a matter of fact. Now he's in West Virginia, but sort of on our side of West Virginia, and uh, uh, just recently, as a matter of fact. So it'll be nice to, uh, to see Dan again uh, more often. In any case, now I premiered a piece that he had written some years ago called Arioso. And the one thing I've noticed, uh, and you know, one of the things that uh, I've always felt that, that the good Lord blessed me with was a reasonably decent memory. Once I learn a piece, I usually learn the piece. You know, I, I know it, I can remember it. You notice I haven't used a piece of music yet. And, um, but I have to be careful about that because a colleague of mine, known to some of you in this room, as a matter of fact, once played a very, very difficult concert in Texas, cover to cover, two, probably two solid hours. And, uh, and he's a wonderful concert organist. And he, uh, uh, afterward, he's at the reception and this little boy walks up. He played the whole thing from memory, everything from memory. This little boy walked up to him and said, you know, my mommy plays the organ too. And he says, oh, that's great. He says, yeah, but she knows how to read music. <laughs> um, as a result of that, there is no way I will ever play a program without music of some sort. In any case, the, the one thing I have noticed as I've gotten older, and yes, 45 years at the Wanamaker Organ gives you some idea of the fact that, uh, that I, you know, I didn't just get off the boat and uh, um, I probably should think about retiring at some point, but this is just way too much fun being with folks like you. So uh, in any case, I have never been able to, to memorize Ariosa. Now I premiered it at the Kimmel Center. As a matter of fact, I was doing a concert at the Kimmel Center in Verizon Hall. Dan and his wife, uh, drove up from Tennessee to hear it because it was the premiere. It was the last time my, my uh, father, who died six years ago, was the last time he heard me play, and uh, and he was there. And uh, uh, so as a result of that, um, I, I premiered the piece. And I've played it a couple of times since. Dan always kind of said, well, you know, you, you change a note here and there. And I'm like, well, I said, you know, I said, you wrote the piece, I fixed it. In any case, uh, so now, when he said, like, like the copy that I have says, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing this is signed by him. He recently sent me another piece he, he composed that I have not yet learned. It's a new piece for organ. And uh, the inscription in the front says, could you at least use this as a starting point? Okay. So uh, it's, it's kind of a wonderful relationship with Dan. But this is Dan Gothrop's Ario, so I will use the music and um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not close enough to any of the people here who I know who are fabulous musicians so they'd be able to tell if I'm actually following the music or not.
much every one of us who plays at the, I'm still getting used to that, I got cataracts done, so I can see all of you just fine now, but then I can't see the music without playing lessons. In any case, um, each one of us who plays at the store, it will always be Wanamakers to those of us there, there this long, actually, uh, but Macy's, I might add, I, I should really not just say that without saying that Macy's, probably in my four and a half decades there, other than the Wanamaker family, the best stewards of that instrument of any of the owners that have come along over the years. So they're phenomenal with the instrument. Uh, in any case, we all have kind of our signature piece that only kind of we play there. And mine is the piece I'm gonna play next, which for those of you who wanted to hear sort of more of a major, kind of an organ, you know, a major organ work from that standpoint uh, is the Strauss Festival entry. Normally, I wouldn't program a piece like that unless I had a really, really big organ because of the nature of the piece. Um, this instrument, because of the technology uh, that uh, uh, I'm just getting used to, Alan's Apex technology, which is uh, such high resolution and uh, so realistic in terms of, of its uh, ability to produce uh, organ sound, that you can uh, feel more comfortable programming uh, a little bit more challenging piece of music. Uh, in it that requires a, a, a little bit more th thought as you're playing through it. Um, this happens to be my signature piece at the store. Uh, I'm also, uh, although it's not in the bio, uh, I've also, in about the last five, six years, uh, have been playing the instrument in Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City. Uh, for those of you who know that instrument, that, uh, that and the Wanamaker organ, it's interesting that they're 60 miles apart and they're the two largest playing musical instruments in the world, uh, as a matter of fact. So, um, in any case, I've, I've begun playing this particular piece, the Strauss Festival Entry, on both instruments. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of fascinating because the instruments themselves are so different, and yet they, they uh, so the, 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 uh, uh, the presentation of the piece is different. And that's the thing, for those of you who are organists, you already know this, but for those of you who are not, keep in mind that when you come to a place like any organist here, if they were to come here to play a concert, um, they would have to do the same thing I did, and that's get used to a whole other instrument. No matter what you're used to playing, this is a, you know this is now different. It's not you know a violinist takes their Stradivarius out of the case and they know exactly what it's going to do. Whereas every instrument is different, and the other thing is every space in which that instrument is installed is different. Um, so uh, you know like. In some situations, the console might be in the center or in the back where I could hear both sides. Here I'm having to sort of gauge what I think the other side is doing, and uh, that takes in a little bit more practice time. So um, in any case, uh, just to give you some idea of kind of the way, the way we approach uh, an instrument like this. Um, so this is the Strauss Festival Entry, which actually will, at the end, will use the, the trumpet in the back. So for those of you back there, um, if you like soft organ music, this is not your piece. Uh, it's like being, I, I, I'm also 33 years at, at Longwood Gardens, and people would come in for Christmas and they would see the console, the big monster console, at one end of the ballroom. And I used to like to stand in the back and, and you invariably hear people say, let's sit in the back, it won't be as loud, because they assume that the sound from the console, which it does not. And all of the loudest military trumpets at Longwood are right over their heads in the back. So I wait till about a third of the program and then annihilate the entire process of that. So, so organists, and those of you who are organists know this, have a really, really strange sense of humor. So at least I warned you on that one.
Some years ago, um, Longwood Gardens, one of my other favorite places to play, redid their entire fountain show. And it's wonderful. For those of you who know anything about the gardens, you know that that's kind of their big thing, as it were. And uh, to, to me, the most fascinating thing about it is, and I've never actually looked at the technology, although I have access to, to somebody showing me, but there are a number of fountains that are like to the front of the show, and it shoots this stream of water really high in the air. I think it's like 15, 20 feet in the air or more. And somehow they're able to shoot a, under high pressure, propane gas up through the center of the water, and they ignite the top of it. So you've got this water column, and the column itself doesn't have any fire. There's like this, this flame sitting on top of the, uh, of the uh, fountains. It's really the most interesting thing. It's online. You can find it on, on YouTube. You'll find Longwood Gardens Fountains. Anyway, so when they were doing that, um, I resurrected a, a piece of uh, English uh, organ music called Fountain Reverie by the English composer Percy Fletcher. And uh, uh, it shows off a totally different character of this instrument. Uh, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and uh, more of a string kind of sound, as it were. Um, and uh, so I, I thought that would make a, a nice addition to this program after all of the, the hooting and hollering of the Strauss, as it were. So uh, this is Percy Fletcher's Fountain Reverie. Thank you. 
One of the, uh, one of the, the sort of the value added of the technology that is available in an instrument like this uh, are sounds that are not organ sounds, uh, strangely enough. Uh, they're called Genesis voices, and what it is is it's a, a couple of hundred, I'm not sure the exact number, uh, but it kind of takes the place of what we used to call, uh, although this instrument is MIDI interfaced, and can, MIDI is a language and can attach to another MIDI device, a digital piano or anything else uh, uh, that, uh, that is MIDI interfaced, and, uh, uh, or even a computer for that matter. But uh, Genesis voices are not MIDI, they are real organ stops. Uh, but the thing is, they include things that are not real organ stops. <laughs> so, like bells and whistles. And uh, so I picked a piece by Keith Chapman's teacher, who was Richard Purvis. And Richard Purvis was uh, the director of music at San Francisco's famed uh, uh, Grace Cathedral. Anybody ever been to Grace Cathedral in San Francisco? You have, I have not. Uh, I'm sure it was an experience, uh, actually. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful place and a wonderful music uh, program there and, and history of music. Uh, but as I say, my teacher, Keith Chapman, the one to make organist when I started there, had studied uh, with Richard Purvis. And although Purvis wrote a lot of pretty serious music, to say the least, uh, he wrote some things that were kind of fun. This one is called, uh, in English, it's The Little Bells. It's Le Petit Clochet. And uh, it, except for the, there's like a little middle section of it that uses some organ stops, the rest of it really is all just kind of fluff and bells and whistles and things of that nature that, uh, that you will hear. So uh, this is the purpose, the little bells. The, uh, uh, one of the nicer sounds that, that organs make that I think people like to hear, especially in meditative times or meditation times in service, uh, would be like the, the types of string sound that you've heard. But you haven't heard a piece that uses almost exclusively string sound, which is what I'll do next. Um, the point I want to make is that we're using this instrument today for a concert. You know, it's a, something to come out on a, on, a, on a day when there isn't really much else to do, actually. 
Um, and uh, uh, in any case, but th that's not the purpose of the instrument. This instrument is here for one, really one function only, and that is to support the worship and prayer life of this congregation and in fact this community. So that's, that's the whole point behind it. That's why it's here. Uh, that's why any instrument is in a house of worship. And um, it's just that uh, when you have an instrument uh, that's really very nice, it's nice to be able to present it to the community at, by itself, as it were, uh, because then it, it allows it to function in, in yet another way, sort of a value added, if you like, for lack of a better way to put it. So um, one of the things that uh, is important to me, for example, and I, I have this discussion with other church musicians all the time. Uh, this is my 62nd year as a church musician, so I've got a little bit of experience to go on. Uh, but in any case, um, I, I will pre play a prelude uh, before a worship service, but rarely to never, oh, as a matter of fact, it's not rarely to never, it's never will I ever play anything loud. Because people come in, they leave whatever cares and woes they might have at the door, and they come into a house of worship for basically a different kind of time. And, and I feel that they need that time to be able to just sit and kind of meditate on that. So wallpapering the room with sound and pinning their ears back to the pew behind them to me is not the way to start a worship service. So this would be a piece I would pick for that. And it's, uh, it's another George Frederick Handel, as I say, you can't ever go wrong with George. Um, it's just an air from the 12th suite. Uh, he wrote a number of suites like this, and this particular one was not written for the organ, by the way, uh, but as were most of the things that we play, at, as we call it, at the store. <laughs> so uh, a lot of transcription playing, but uh, in any case, this is the, the air from the 12th suite by George Frederick Handel. Uh, for those of you who like soft organ music, this is your piece. Some years ago, <clears throat> my wife and I went up to New Haven, Connecticut, to Yale University, uh, wherein is, in my opinion, and I, I know there are, I don't know, too many organists who would disagree with me on that, 
the organ in Woolsey Hall at Yale University, in my opinion, is the finest instrument on the planet, bar none. And that's, that's my personal opinion, but I, I know a lot of organists share that opinion with me. It really is an organist's organ in every sense of the word. The master of that organ for so many years was Professor Thomas Merrill. Um, and uh, Tom recently retired, we've been friends for years, and, and uh, my wife Claire and I have gone up and visited him. And uh, he took us, uh, in addition to wandering about the university, um, and then we, we had lunch at the table next to the table where the Whiffenproof song was, was written. Uh, that's a very famous thing there at Yale. And uh, in any case, uh, so then we went to this church that's right near the university where he's been helping out. And I was thinking to myself as we're in there, I said, do these people really know who they have wandering in, substituting at their church? Uh, you know, probably one of the most foremost organists in the whole world ever, as it were. So uh, in any case, so Tom sat down and he started playing this piece. And I'm like, what is that? He says, oh, he says, it's this march. I said, what's it called? He said, well, I think it's called Stately March. I said, who wrote it? He said, J. Lamont Galbraith. And I said, and who might that be? He said, I haven't a clue. So he said, I, I, he'd written some other stuff. I kind of looked it up. He said, I, I, somebody sent me a handwritten copy of this. And he said, if you want it, I'll send it to you. I said, well, I haven't heard you play the piece yet. yet. So uh, anyway, he, he played the piece. And I thought, yeah, it's a, it's a nice piece. Uh, you know. So uh, I said, yeah, send me, send me the handwritten copy. And um, so he did. And uh, so I, I figured I would uh, kind of close out with that because uh, again, for those of you who like soft organ music, this really isn't your piece. And, um, but it, it's, a, it, it's a march type piece. But then again, like many pieces of its nature um, that are, are so musical, it's got this nice little middle section. So it, it doesn't just kind of take this march and fire it at you constantly. Uh, it then comes back to it. So this is J. Lamont Galbraith's Stately March.
You know, Bruce had talked about the possibility of an encore. I got a better idea. Uh, and we had talked about it before, so uh, I, think it would, I think it would work at this point. And that is uh, kind of to bring everything all together. For one, you have a piano here as well as the organ, so we should use them together. Um, Bruce is one of those people who, like me and several other people I know in this room, slug it out on, on a week-to-week-to-week -to -week -to -week basis. If there's one thing that's, one, there are two things about church music that are always there. One of them is it's always rewarding, and the other is it's always relentless. So it does take a lot of dedication to be able to do it, and those of you who do it know exactly what I mean from that standpoint. But again, going back to the fact that this instrument is here to support the worship and prayer life of this congregation and community, um, let's have Bruce come up here and we're gonna do a little Bach number. For those of you who are sitting there saying, he didn't play one thing in my Bach. So, and it's sort of like, you know, when I do the demonstrations at the Kimmel Center, uh, the Russian roulette there is asking people what they want to hear. And that is never a good idea to an audience just coming in and stuff like that because they get to talk to me there. And you might imagine, I would say if we took a poll, you would all, most of you would come up with exactly the first two things on the list of things people would want to hear. The first is Phantom of the Opera. And what they want to hear is they want to hear that big B flat chord uh, that begins it, uh, or a B, a B minor chord rather. And then the second thing, of course, is the Bach Staccata and Fugue in D minor, uh, which is the two things. So what I usually do is, I, I turn around, sit at the console, just get the organ on the loudest possible sound I think it can make musically, play a B minor chord, get up and say, okay, now get that out of your system. <laughs> then I'll play the first three notes of the Toccata and D minor and just simply walk away. So you see, so uh, it, it just you know frustrates the daylights out of them, but what can I tell you, as I, I've already, already admitted to the sense of humor that organists have. But in this case, this isn't meant to be that. This is, this is meant to finish this program with something that is basically meditative, definitely worship, and, and really the, the proper use of the music resources in this or any church.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudy. And thank you all for attending today. We hope you enjoyed the day. It was a special treat for me, I hope as well as for you. We'd uh, offer and uh, like to see you downstairs afterwards for light refreshments. And as I said, two lines down there. And I, before we go, I want to give a shout out to uh, Brandon Wood for doing our tech and AV today. I wanted you to be able to see Rudy and what he does at the cockpit here. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. And uh, Debbie Ziegler and Marsha Hoyer are downstairs with the food. So thank you. We'll all see you downstairs. Thank you for coming. Closing prayer? Okay. All right. Seth, you're on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Seth Noggle. I'm one of the ministers here at Trinity. Uh, so I'm just going to say a quick prayer for us. And thank you all for attending tonight. Oh, dear God, we just give you so much thanks. Thank you for um, the beauty of music and all the arts that we have in this world. We thank you uh, for the abilities that Rudy was able to um, play today. And uh, we just thank you for all the worship that we were able to give uh, as we listen to uh, our, this beautiful organ. Uh, and now bless the food and uh, bless this fellowship. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.